Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal. It's Tuesday. I hope wherever you're watching or listening to this around the world, you're having a very, very good start to the week. The Champions League returns. We are at that stage of the season. What an exciting stage of the season it always is. And of course, this season, it is even more exciting because Arsenal are involved in the knockout stages of the Europe's elite club competition. We've waited a long time to say that. Can't wait for it. Of course, Arsenal not in action this week. They're going to have to wait a little bit longer, travelling to Porto next Wednesday night. I'll be heading over to Portugal on that one, heading over on Tuesday for the pre match press conference. And then the game, really looking forward to getting over there for it. Have to wait um, another week or so, but there is plenty to sit back and enjoy tonight as the Champions League returns. Arsenal in action in the Premier League on Saturday, of course, travelling to Burnley, looking to build on the momentum they've built up in recent weeks, looking to make it five wins in a row in the league as well. So we'll look, take a little look ahead to that game in today's video. We'll go over the latest injury news. Got a bit of an update on Emil Smith-Rowe, who missed out at West Ham at the weekend. We'll talk about Marquinhos, who's about to complete his move to Brazil. Now the Olympian qualifying is out of the way. You've got plenty of questions and comments from you as well. So let's get started, shall we? And we'll start with Emil Smith-Rowe. Really disappointing at the weekend when the team sheet came out and Smith-Rowe wasn't listed amongst the starting eleven or even the substitutes for the game at West Ham. Had lots of cost questions from you guys sending in what's going on with Smith Rowe. So this is my understanding on the situation. He's got an ankle problem, not a massive one, which is good news. It happened in training on Thursday. He leapt over a sliding tackle and came down on his ankle. Now, you know, everyone who plays football know when you sort of you can roll your ankle, what sort of you know, injury that is and what it can be like. And sometimes you can tweak your ligaments and things like that. And it can be more of a uh, sort of long term thing. My understanding is that this isn't, you know, at first sort of signs of it are that it's not a long term thing or anything like that. It's just one of those sort of freak things, you know, lots of people again, going, oh, this is, you know, Smith Rowe, this is why we can't rely on him, which I'm sorry, this, that's, that's rubbish. This isn't a muscular injury or anything like that. It's not a body breaking down type injury. It's just one of those horrible football things that happens that can happen in a match, can happen in training when you just roll your ankle a little bit. It happens all the time. It's what happened to Smith Rowe. Um, I understand he wanted to, he wanted to sort of carry on and play and try and be involved in the weekend against West Ham, but Arsenal like, no, well, let, let's, let's, not risk anything here. Let's make sure you're all right. Um, and, you know, it must have been hugely frustrating for Smith Rowe to sit and sort of watch that on the touchline. Uh, well, not on the touchline. He wasn't at the stadium, but w watching it from home must have been hugely frustrating because that was the type of game that Smith Rowe would have absolutely reveled in. The amount of space Arsenal had, the movement that they were uh, they were producing between them, the sort of fluid fluidity in the attack. You know, it was tailor-made for Emil Smith Rowe. Whether he'd started the game or he'd come on as a substitute, you think he would have had an absolute field day out there. So it must have been really frustrating to sit there sort of watching it with his ankle injury. Um, but it's not supposed to be a bad one. I can tell it's pretty minor. And you know, as I said, he wanted to play at the weekend in that game. But Arsenal like, let's not take any risks. Let's make sure you're right. You know, this weekend might come a little bit too soon. You have to wait and see how the ankle settles down a little bit. It's just, you know, bruised or swollen. Don't think there's anything more serious than that. So he will be back very, very soon. It's not some muscular injury like I've seen lots of people moaning about and saying, oh, this is why we can't rely on Smith Rowe. The same with... Gabriel Jesus and things like that. You know, it's just a freak little football accident that happens in training all the time. And he should be back very, very soon, which is really good news for him. And it's really good news for Arsenal as well, because, you know, with the fact that Smith Rowe is now working his way back up the pecking order and, you know, seems to be in Mikel's thinking when it comes to team selection, whether that be starting 11 or substitute, that's a good thing because Arsenal need a really strong squad, especially with the Champions League now starting. You want a really strong squad with a lot of options on uh, that you can turn to if needs be. And uh, Smith Rowe absolutely is one of those because he's got a huge amount to offer to this Arsenal team. And if he comes back fit and he can stay fit between now and the end of the season, then Arsenal are going to be much, much stronger for it. So that's the latest on Emil Smith Rowe. Elsewhere, Jesus and Zinchenko, again, going to be late assessments on them ahead of the game against uh, Burnley at the weekend. Tommy Asu, fingers crossed, could be OK for that. It was just a minor thing with, with Tommy Asu, came back sort of nursing a bit of a problem from the Asia Cup. You, you know, nothing particularly serious or anything like that. Arsenal just felt it was best given the amount of travel he's had. 
um, that they weren't going to take any risks with him against West Ham, but they are hopeful that he will be back pretty soon. So could well have Tommy Asu involved against Burnley. We'll have to wait and see Zinchenko and Jesus. That'll be a decision for, that will be taken later on in a week. But when you look at what Arsenal are doing going forward at the moment and what the options that they suddenly have in attack, you know, as good as Jesus is and as good as he was against Nottingham Forest in his last appearance, of course, man of the match in that game, scoring one and setting up one in the two games that followed. You've had either Havertz playing as a central striker or you've had Trossard playing as a central striker and both of them put in excellent performances in that position. And also, if you, you could start with one or start with the other and then you can just rotate in game like they did against West Ham when at some point you'd have Havertz leading the line other times you'd have Trossard leading the line they'd all be floating around um, and you know pulling West Ham all all over the place because of their the way they were moving and you could do that against Burnley at the weekend and suddenly Arsenal's attacking options don't look anywhere near as kind of weak or, or as um, uh, limited as perhaps they did not so long ago you know Eddie Nketi is not going to look in at the moment and in terms of starting 11 and when you think that Normally, when Jesus has been out, it has been Eddie who Arteta's turned to. Now, suddenly, it's been Havertz and then it's been Trossard. What that says about Eddie, I mean, we'll have to wait and see when, when it comes to the summer. But certainly, he seems to be right down at the bottom of the pecking order all of a sudden when it comes to playing as a central striker, even though technically he's probably the only one there is other than Gabriel Jesus in the squad. So, yeah, we'll wait and see what happens on Jesus and Zinchenko. But Tommy Asu, hopefully, will be fine for the weekend's game. And like I said, a late decision will be taken on Smith Row. But no risk going to be taken, especially the fact that Arsenal have that trip in the Champions League on that they're flying out to on the Tuesday night. You know, if uh, there's any sort of doubt over any of those players, that I imagine at the weekend they will uh, they will err on the side of caution with all of them. Okay, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Ethan Manieri now after his a uh, very sort of eye-catching cameo, I would say, against West Ham. It was perfect for him in that game, wasn't it? West Ham out on their feet, Arsenal just you know toying with them dominating possession, loads of space. It was perfect to send on Manieri to sort of showcase some of his talents. And I thought he did that. And what was it, like I said, an eye-catching cameo. Lots of you guys have been uh, sort of getting in touch and talking about Manieri. I pulled a few of the comments together here. I'm going to have to squint because I can struggle to see them. In fact, I'm going to see them a little bit better on this one that I've got. So Paddy says, with Manieri playing and Saka's um, milestone, how do you view Sesk's legacy now? With how insane Wanieri coming in now feels, what Cesc did when he came in feels mad. The level Cesc was playing at so young, but then you look at what Saka has done and it's hard to compare them. Uh, Jay says, it seems a little weird to me that someone who's not old enough to sign a professional contract is allowed to play in a Premier League match. Seems super risky from an injury liability standpoint. I hadn't really thought about it, I have to say. Uh, and Goon72 says, some may criticise Arteta about giving young players a chance but as Wanieri is only 16, you don't want to drop a young teenager into a tough and tight game. If you do, it can seriously set back his progress and confidence. So giving him 15 minutes in a game like yesterday is the right one to give him some game time. That's good game management. Yeah, I think it's really easy. I mean, Wanieri, is, he's 16. It's so mad. I said it in yesterday's show. Just think what you were doing at 16. Think what most people are doing at 16. And he's coming on in a Premier League game. You know, a lot of people point to what City are doing with some of the youngsters this season, what Liverpool are done with Conor Bradley. But those guys are like four years older than Arsenal's crop. Maybe you could say Walters should have got some opportunities. I think he probably should have done, certainly in the PSV game. I know lots of people, well, not lots of people, but there was some disappointment that Cedric came on ahead of him um, in the game at the weekend. Um, but as I said before, I'm not I'm not sure if Walters, what Walters' future is in terms of Arsenal. I know they're talking about a new contract at the moment, but... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Walters ended up going in the summer. But when you look at the actual sort of real crop of young kids coming through who might get a chance at Arsenal in the next couple of years, they're so, so young. So young. I mean, 16 years old. That is unreal to be coming on and making your second Premier League appearance at that age. Um, uh, so, yeah, and I think it is, I'd say it is good management in terms of how he's being uh, sort of eased into things. And you just don't want to put too much pressure on such a young kid's shoulders. Um the, the top one's really interesting from Paddy there. Where he's talking about, you know, Wanieri coming on and Saka hitting 50 goals already at just 22. And then saying, how do you view Sesk's legacy? Well, Sesk's legacy is just unbelievable. I mean, what he did coming over from abroad, settling into a new club, a new country, a new culture, doing what he did, forcing his way into the Invincibles team. Unbelievable. Um, you know, the sort of thing that you barely ever see. And, but, but he is, we are talking about a generational talent in Cesc Fabregas here, you know, one of the very best midfielders 
that the Premier League has ever seen, that recent times has ever seen. And you get those players very, very rarely. And so, yeah, when you talk about Seth's legacy, look, as much as I hated the way he left the club and it absolutely left a bit of a sour taste in my mind anyway, in terms of what he did on the pitch and the talent that he was when he came through, it barely, you know, you just don't see that. He was that good. He was absolutely unreal player who was a complete and utter joy to watch. And like I said, it just doesn't happen very often. Okay, final game of the game week yesterday in the Premier League. Chelsea winning 3-1 at Crystal Palace, leaving it late. Conor Gallagher, Gallagher getting a couple. Enzo Fernandez scoring right at the end as well. Chelsea up to the dizzying heights of 10th in the Premier League for them. So that's how the league table looks at the end of match week 24. Man City still with that game in hand. Liverpool top, two points clear of Man City and Arsenal. Look at that goal difference. 32 for Liverpool. And then Man City and Arsenal both on 31. Arsenal have done their goal difference a world of good since coming back from Dubai, beating Crystal Palace 5-0, beating um, West Ham 6-0, and then having the wins against Liverpool and Nottingham Forest where they scored five goals and only conceded two. So that is a huge boost to their goal difference. And uh, they have caught right up now. And who knows, when you look at the table and how tight it is, that could be absolutely essential come the end of the season. Um, so, yeah, really, really big. That So that's how it looks going into the weekend's game against Burnley. I think Man City have got, I should check this, but I'm going to actually search while I'm uh, talking. So apologies for that. But who have Man City got this week? They've got Chelsea. I thought they did. So that's interesting. It's at the Etihad, of course. And Chelsea, you just never know what's going to who's going to turn up. But you kind of think yesterday's result could be a good thing for Chelsea going into that game at the Etihad. It'll give them a little bit of a boost. They've come off the back of the good FA Cup win against Aston Villa recently as well, when they've gone away and got a really good result. So for Arsenal, maybe, maybe you can look at that and think there's an opportunity of City dropping some points. Having said that, I've kind of felt that exact same thing about a week ago when Chelsea went up to Liverpool. Thought, you never know, they might do something and they got absolutely steamrolled and were absolutely dreadful. So I doubt it, but you never know. You can hold on to these sort of tiny little hopes, I guess. OK, moving on to Marquinhos now. His move should be completed very, very soon. Back to Brazil, as we've spoken about in the last sort of week or so when it comes to Marquinhos. Deal to Fluminense looks pretty much done and dusted now, just waiting for it all to be signed after his um, uh, his involvement with Brazil in the, in the Olympic qualifier has been completed. That has now happened. So Arsenal expecting that deal to go through loan um, with an option to turn it permanent at the end of the uh, the Brazilian season. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he gets on over there. Feels like a move that he needs. It might be exactly what he needs to sort of reignite his career. Had a good start when he came over to Arsenal, made a bit of an impact, but a couple of loan spells haven't really worked. He needs to sort of try and breathe a little bit of new life into, into his career. Maybe going back to his homeland will do that. So expect that deal to be completed pretty, pretty soon. Right, moving on to some of your questions and comments now. Can't tell you how many I had about my ratings yesterday, which I explained once again in terms of my thinking about it. I liked Sea Lord's one here. It says, not sure why everyone's complaining about Charles's player ratings. Should just do what I do. Take the ratings he does, give every single player plus one, then take a look and think, yeah, that seems about right. I think he's absolutely spot on. That is exactly how you should probably do it. Um, Judith here underneath says, hi, Charles. I totally agree with your rating system. So there you go. I've got some support. Says, for me, a 10 out of 10 performance requires an almost historic performance in which the opposition also play well. One that stands out for me was Santi against City in 2015. 100%. Now that is a 10 out of 10 performance. Wonder if you could tell us what performances have been what other performances have been a 10 in your eyes? I thought this was really interesting. It got me thinking um, about 10 out of 10 performances that I would give in my player ratings. And I've got a few that um, I think of. I mean, Arshavin against Liverpool, which is a weird one because he didn't actually do that much in that game. He'd barely touched the ball, but he, what he did, he scored four goals at Anfield. And I, I, I'm sorry, you could be awful for the rest of the game. You could fall over the ball every time you get the ball. But if you score four goals at Anfield, I think you'd probably get a 10 out of 10 performance. So you can put Julio Baptista into that list as well for what he did in the League Cup game against Liverpool as well. So I'd give those two 10 out of 10. Carnu versus Chelsea, for example, coming on Arsenal 2 0 down. He scores a hat trick. Arsenal win 3 2. He gets a last minute winner scoring from the corner flag. That's a 10 out of 10 game. Henri versus Liverpool in the Invincible season. You know, 2 1 down at half time. 
Arsenal had just gone out of the Champions League, just gone out of the FA Cup, season on the line almost. Invincible's record on the line. He scores a hat trick. Arsenal win 4 2. You know, that gets it. Cesc, we we're talking about Cesc earlier on. Cesc versus Aston Villa. I don't know if any of you remember this game. It was, it was in the year when Arsenal and Villa were going head to head for like fourth spot, basically. And Cesc could be nursing an injury for a while. It had hamstring problem. He was on the bench. He couldn't start the game. Arsenal needed him. Wenger sent him on. Cesc scored two goals in about 20 minutes. Single-handedly won the game and then pulled his hamstring, scoring the second goal and had to go off again. He was only on the pitch for about 20 minutes, but he just won the game through injury. Uh, you know, that one, uh, Santi versus City, obviously, we talked about. Henri at the San Siro. You know, one of the most remarkable individual performances you'll ever see in a game that Arsenal had to go there and win and he inspires them to a historic 5-1 win. Uh, Alexis Sanchez at West Ham, the hat trick he scored there, which was just it was just a monster of a performance from Sanchez. Burkamp versus Leicester in '97, the hat trick. Um, I remember Burkamp versus Everton. I think it was seven um, nil. That was David Moyes as well. Um, it was seven nil in I think it was the 2004-2005 season, and he. It was when Arsenal were trying to get him, or Arsenal fans wanted him to sign for another year. I was there at Highbury and we were all chanting one more year, one more year. And he just produced this masterclass of a performance, set up set up all three goals in the first half, scored another one in the second half, a 7-0 win. So that game, I, I always think, when it comes to Dennis Bergkamp. Anders Limpar and Ian Wright in 91, well, 99, no, I can't remember what year it was. It wasn't 91. Um, but it was around that time. It was on my birthday, actually, December the 21st. And uh, Arsenal beat Everton 4-2 at Highbury. And Limpar set up all four goals and Wright scored all four. So both of those, I give a 10 out of 10. So those are the performances when I'm talking about when you give someone a 10 out of 10 performance. So that's a list of some of those. But if you guys have got any other thoughts who deserves 10 out of 10s, you know, truly historical 10 out of 10 performances, let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for that, Judith. I appreciate that one. That was good, uh, good fun to think about. Vet Parra says, something that didn't get any coverage at all is that Ben White was inverting from right back at West Ham. I think that took a lot of pressure off Kivior and helped our midfield dominance. I thought he did that really well. His on-the-ball um, capability is so underrated. Fabulous footballer. Such a pest from set pieces also. He absolutely is. Yeah, look, I spoke about Ben, right, ben, um, uh, ben White yesterday in the video, and I thought he did really, really well. And I thought he's done so well since Dubai. <laughs> Someone was saying, weren't they, yesterday, it was that his performance levels are measured by his tan levels and going to Dubai has obviously supercharged him. Um, but you're right about him inverting. That was very, very obvious at the weekend. I thought that you, when you watched it, you could see he was doing that. And that was allowing Kivior to be a little bit more of a natural left back, which it just makes sense, doesn't it? When you've got a player as good as Ben White, who can play where he plays on the, on the pitch and is such a good technically gifted footballer, if you're asking a fullback to to invert and you don't have a Zinchenko or someone like that, and you're playing a centre back at left back instead, then it makes sense just to play to switch it round and allow Ben White to become the extra man in the field and let Kivior do what he's good at, which is defending. And um and he did that against West Ham. And I thought after a little bit of a nervy start, Kivior played well against West Ham. Um and yeah, I think you're absolutely right there, Vet Para, that um uh, Ben White deserves his flowers for that performance and. Um, maybe Mikel Arteta deserves the, his flowers as well for that little tactical tweak that we saw in that game. Hamster Dow here says, I can understand West Ham fans laughing when Rice thumped in the sixth. That was exactly my reaction when he gave away the penalty at the end of the Emirates game. There comes a time when so much is going wrong and in such a you-can't-make-it-up way that it becomes comic. Yesterday, they will linger long in the memory uh, after the Emirates match has been forgotten. Yeah. 100%. This got me thinking as well of those sort of moments where you're just like, oh, you're having a laugh. And um, those sort of things do happen in football. And that's like, I, I generally, you could hear laughing when Declan Rice scored that goal from the West Ham fans all around me because it had just become that comical. And it was like, of course he was going to score. After everything else that had gone wrong, of course Declan Rice was going to smack one into the top corner from 30 yards. And I thought back, like the, the Man United, the 8-2, you know, one of the worst memories I have of watching Arsenal when they went to Old Trafford and got thumped take two. And it was just like, it was at that point where every single shot they were hitting from 25 yards was going in the top corner. And you're just like, oh, of course, another one goes into the top corner. When the build up to Arsenal's first game against Man United after Robin Van Persie had, had made the move to United, all the build up over it. And then <laughs> within five minutes, like basically the first time the ball goes into the penalty area, I think it was Vermaelen or someone slipped and just gave the ball to Van Persie to score. And you're just like, oh, for God's sake. You just, all you can do is almost laugh at how ridiculous it is. And yeah, there are moments like that that happen in football. And um, I thought it absolutely was 100% uh, one of those moments at the weekend. 
Uh, here's another one from Charles. Uh, it says, nobody was looking down on set pieces. The worry was the lack of goals from open play. This was in response to what I said yesterday about, again, how set pieces proved to be so important for Arsenal. Um, how it sort of changes the game state of a game and the fact that Arsenal could get that first goal from a set piece against West Ham, then open the game up to allow them to do what they did uh, after that. He says, Charles, we had an issue breaking down teams from open play. So where would Odegaard get these magical 14, 15 assists, you claim? We are so e eager to push agendas for the popular guys like Odegaard and Kai. I'm not sure anyone's been pushing an agenda for Kai. Kai's been hammered left, right and centre all season, it feels like. Uh, we are so eager to push agendas for the popular guys like Odegaard and Kai Yet the not-so-fancy players like Big Gabby don't get talked about. His head and ability, his balls over the top have created opportunities, but you highlight Odegaard passing the ball to our players with a wall of defenders around them as creating a chance. I'm happy for the win, but agenda pushing is unbelievable. I honestly, I don't understand what you're getting at here, Charles. Um, I highlighted Odegaard passing the ball to Odegaard. had... Did you see the stats I pulled up yesterday? I think he created seven chances in the game. He got two assists. That's not just passing the ball to our players. He was creating chance after chance. He should have had more assists. And when you say we had an issue breaking teams down from open play, I kind of see that in a way. But also Arsenal, their biggest issue is not taking their chances in their shot conversion rate. That's the problem. And as Odegaard, like, you know, he's the first player in Europe's top seven leagues this season to create 50 plus chances. So he has been creating a chance. I think he's created in the Premier League up to stats. Of course, he's created 14 big chances or 13 big chances for players. And that's just big chances. There's so many other chances he's created as well. So he can easily have 12, 13, 14 assists this season. That's not agenda pushing. It's just fact. So I'm not quite sure. I, I think you're right to highlight Gabby 100%. He deserves so much, you know, he deserves so much praise. And uh, he goes under the radar a lot because of Saliba. Um, and Gabby deserves a huge amount of praise. And I try and praise him an awful lot. Um, in fact, I think I do praise him an awful lot, but I'm not pushing any agenda when it comes to Odegaard. I'm just speaking facts. The guy's unbelievably good. And his numbers absolutely back that up. And if people had actually taken a lot of the chances that he's been creating for them this season, his numbers would be far higher than they are right now. So, yes, no, not agenda pushing. That was just uh, me talking about facts, to be honest. And here's one from, I think that's Eugene Crocker or something. It says, Charles, has Saka ever scored a header? I don't remember. He seems to struggle to score his head. He can't be perfect in everything. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see he has scored a header. I think this is his first ever goal he scored at the Emirates Stadium. In fact, it was during the COVID time. I was there. In one, it was one of the behind closed doors game. It was against Sheffield United. I think it was 2020. And he scored a header. He opened the score in. Arsenal won this game 2-1. And he scored a header against certain Aaron Ramsdale in goal for Sheffield United that day. I think that is the only header he scored for Arsenal. I can't think of another one. But that one certainly is very vivid in my mind. Um, so, yeah, but he definitely maybe it is an area where he does need to work out. He was very unlucky not to score against West Ham at the Emirates with a header, I remember. It made a, I think it was Ariola made a really good save in that game when it was still at 1-0 to West Ham. Um, so, yeah, but it probably is an area he needs to work on. I imagine if you ask Saka what, what is an area you need to work on, he'll probably point to his, to his head and ability. But he has scored one, and that was it right now. He was in a 2-1 win against Sheffield United back in about 2020. All right, that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for to what for watching or listening to today's episode. I'll be back tomorrow to do it all over again. Until then, have a very good Tuesday. I'll speak to you soon. Bye bye.